What do I look like now? Black. Can't see anything. Black we screen. We cannot see you. Black screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. You look great. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yeah, let's go early today. Let's go. Oh, well done. Yeah, we told people to show up 30 minutes early, and then we're like, yeah, let's just go now. <laughs> During pre-show banter today, we have Jack Recider from Darknet Diaries, which is awesome. Then we also are announcing all the different open source solutions that we have for backdoors and breaches. And if you're like, what's backdoors and breaches? It's not that. Uh, it's a card game that we created to to do incident response. Uh, it's like Dungeons and Dragons meets incident response meets a Yu-Gi-Oh card game for more so. Let's see what else we need to cover. Hi, I'm Jason Blanchard. Hi, I'm Deb Wiggly. Oh. <laughs> I'm Ryan. <laughs> I'm Ralph. Thanks, Ralph. I just had to, I'd make it like, I don't know, just like slow. Yeah, like, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. I appreciate that. Yeah, it, it really does sound better when you get close. I don't know why. Really? No, because it can get real deep. Yeah. <laughs> then we have Jack here. Jack, say hi, please. I am Jack Recider. Good, good day, everyone. Hey, everybody. Hey. So, Jack, thanks for being here today. We invited you because we were like, hey, we were on, uh, John was on your podcast, so, and we wanted to invite you on because of the amount of good things that you're doing for the overall InfoSec community. And not only just getting to hear, you know, great stories of people doing their jobs and interesting stories, uh, but it's just good. It's a really great podcast. And so I wanted to ask you, like, how'd you get started? Why did you start it? So that's two questions. So how did you get started? Why did you start? I was a network security engineer before this doing um, firewall administration, IPS administration, and SOC work while looking at the SIM and stuff. And I uh, kind of got burnt out on that. And at the same time, I wanted to do something new. So I started a podcast while I was doing that. And it was because I started it because I wanted to hear I wanted to hear kind of a slow news version of InfoSec stories. So like, mm -hmm. don't tell me the latest stuff on, on an incident that we really don't know anything about, right? So like when, when SolarWinds incident came out or, or any of that stuff, it's like, okay, we have like one piece of information and, I'm, and that, that kind of bothers me. Like, all right, that's interesting, but I don't really have anything to do about that. And so I like to wait until all the pieces of the story are done. You know, if we can, if we have indictments for who those people are that did that and evidence and proof of who did that. And now we know, like, maybe there's incident responders who are talking about, like, yeah, this is how they got in and all that stuff. That's the story I want to hear. Wait for maybe five, six years before all this stuff comes out and then present it to me. And so that's kind of the news that I just really sink my teeth into where I can hear the entire thing from start to end. And I couldn't find a show like that. I couldn't find a podcast like that. And I was, just, I was such a podcast junkie listening to shows like This American Life and Radio Lab. And I wanted to take that style and turn it into, I mean, I think InfoSec is so full of drama. So we can just, yeah. <laughs> we, I don't have to like spruce it up in any way. It's just coming out its ears. So yeah, it was, it was just that wanting to have that and not having it. And uh that's the style I wanted. And so I read a book and figured out how to do it and started it. So it's kind of like not trying to be the first, but <laughs> trying to be the last, but getting it right. Yeah. Uh, and there's point. something about history being verifiable too, right? So it's like, what, what all, out of all this news, what was actually truth and what was this hype or some strange side derailment, you know, of story? So with that, is, is it kind of a shock to you that it, that it took off as much of it as it did? Like, 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 like you were kind of saying, it's kind of anathema to everything that's out there. I mean, we do a new show like twice a week that is literally, okay, this is what's hot. This is what we're talking about right now. And everybody seems to be rushing that way. So d does it seem strange to you that, that you're doing the thing that's completely different and that seems to be the thing 
that's that's taking off more than the kind of let's get there first news stories. I don't know. I feel I feel like I think of things differently. Like when I watch the Discovery Channel, I'm like, this is stuff for third graders. <laughs> like where's the where's the deep si- deep dive stuff? Like if we're talking about Einstein and they're not getting into actual mathematics, but they're just totally brushing over that part, I'm totally disappointed. Like tell me about the actual mathematics involved because I want to know that. And so where's the Discovery Channel for the people who want just that bit more, you know, that 202 version of it. And, and that's kind of what I gravitate towards, too, is something that actually teaches me and educates me at a level where I'm at, because I'm a college graduate. I'm a professional in my career, right? It's like, where's the, where's, the, where's the educational stuff for that that is entertaining at the same time? And you don't need to dumb it down to the lowest denominator to get there. So I think there must be a market for other people who have that kind of thing that they just really want something, but they don't want to just be bored by it. They want it to be entertaining, but plus educational at the same time. So and doesn't, yeah, I, and I guess and I'm surprised. Help. Yeah, and sorry, I'm kind of kind of, surprised, but it's, it's exciting to see that other people like it too. And doesn't that edutainment, I, you know, for, for years teaching, you know, they always said, you know, the best thing, you know, about SANS is it's edutainment, right? You know, it's not just education, even though that's what they're selling. But it really seems like those stories and those narratives, those stories and those narratives tend to make the actual technical aspects far more sticky, right? It tends to be better learning that technical stuff if you can couple it. Like, here's a story of something that happened to Jason Street. Let's not do that. You know, it, it, it seems to be a lot more sticky to learn the technical aspects whenever you have that human element around it. Yeah, and I, I like to underline all the all the implications of it too. Like, you know, when you have that feeling of bring, being breached, it let's talk about that feeling. You know, that's not just like, okay, this company was breached, let's move on. It's like the people are in panic mode. Their their stomachs have fallen out of their gut. Like they're just some people are going through the different levels of grief, right? They're in they're in denial. They're in like uh you know, all these other these things. And it's like, we can talk about those you know, human emotions of it too. And then that helps us understand the gravity of the situation as well, because I think we, we gloss over some of those parts. And I, I really like to go slow in all these different areas as well. Yeah, I got a chance to, so you did the one with Jake Williams and there was a lot in that episode with Jake Williams and, and I'm going to post the link to it here in a second. But I listened to that when, when it came out, I listened to the whole episode. And then that night, I happened to be at a SANS event with Jake Williams. And it was just like, Jake, I, I just listened to like what happened. And I'd known Jake for years. But like hearing you interview Jake and hearing it all come together and hearing the story, I was like, Jake, holy cow. And it like it just changed like all that stuff just by hearing the way that it was presented. Yeah, it's yeah. it's interesting when you really lean in and listen to like the whole story. And and I think we well, a lot of us have been there, right? We've heard stories at DEF CON or something where it's like, that's insane that that happened to you. And we don't really have a place that we can like just, you know, s- store that for a while and say, okay, let's let's put this so more people can hear it too. So that was another reason why I wanted to hear it. Going to <laughs> DEF CON and hearing people like Jason Street and Jake Williams talk and like, more people need to hear this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and one of the things I thought was really, really interesting from my perspective is whenever you were talking to me, it, it, I, I was like, I don't know, I, I was scatterbrained. I was all over the place. Right. And and you were like, no, 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 no. Just keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. And, it, it, you know, I'm sure that it was very, very disconnected and disjointed and weird. But the way that you actually took that together and you made me sound like a sane person or relatively sane, <laughs> um, it, it made me realize just how much craft, love, and work actually goes into creating your show. Because I, I think that people are under the mistake and assumption that you literally just turn on a microphone or set up recording and when you're done, it's done, right? You know, maybe put a couple of little breaks in. No, you put a tremendous amount of work. Because there was things that I said at the end that showed up at the beginning. There was things that I said in the middle that all of a sudden were shifted to the end. But it really helped make that narrative so much better. And I was just absolutely impressed. Because I don't think a lot of people say, like, here's the raw and here's the final product and just how much better that final product actually is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a process. I, I don't know. I, I, it's, 
I, I don't know where I, I think there's some sort of innate thing I have about storytelling where I, I can hear those parts and stuff. And there is a formula I use, which is um, the formula is basically this is a story about X, but Y happened instead. And so in that formula, you're, you're, you're trying to go in one direction. That's the goal, right? And so, you know, in your story, you were trying to pen test something and something went wrong, right? So we, that's a perfect hook for like storytelling craft. And so that's what I'm looking for when I'm hearing it. And then that's how I'm arranging pieces as I'm telling it. And honestly, I don't know, I, I don't, understand it until i listen to the interview like three times and then i'm like oh i see that's why your your hands were on the ground behind your back and whatever the situation was well i was gonna say like you say you're just a natural storyteller um is that something that you like have felt like you always were and then you just read a book and that helped you become an amazing podcaster perhaps I don't know. It's, it, it's hard to it's hard to teach that part of it. I think there's an artistic part to that. Same with like music, right? It's you can you can kind of teach the the for, the for, the, the you know the like just the style, but you really can't really teach the 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 heart of it, right? To really bring out something extra. So um, yeah, I think I had kind of a knack for it, but then when I yeah when I got the formula, I really understood. And another thing I did was there's a Khan Academy course called uh, Pixar in a Box, which tells the entire it, Pixar teaches how to do storytelling. And so I mm. just you know, ran through all that as well. I mean, that teaches story arc and all this stuff. So that was really helpful too. So one of the questions that I always want to ask people and I, that, that have kind of like exploded and, you know, you get that point where people start referring to you as like a thought leader or any of those different things and it starts getting uncomfortable. Have you entered a point yet with Darknet Diaries where it's it, like it's gotten uncomfortable. And if that uncomfortable point happened at like a conference where people started recognizing you and started taking pictures with you, if that has happened, what was that like? The first time you're like, holy crap, this thing's getting bigger than I thought it was going to get. Yeah, it's, it's, it happens every now and then. So like, I, I'll, I get direct messages from people who work in the security team at Apple, at the NSA, at Google, you know, and it's weird to me because I'm literally in their ear, right? I'm in their head, almost embedded into their head, because they have buds, and I'm telling them stories, and I feel like I do have some sort of influence on on what people understand or or how they can, you know, it, it, change their mindset or security or something. And that is that is that is always surprising to me, just to see how deep my 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 voice gets and yeah i don't know but um there was a i was at defcon what two years ago and like it was wrapping up it was sunday and i i sat down at one of the vendor booths that just happened to clear out already they were gone and i just put my stickers all over the table and i sat at a vendor booth as if I was a vendor. <laughs> and people would come by and say oh i like the stark and I, i'm jack because people don't know what I, what I look like and literally like every four people who walked by the table knew who I was. And so it's just yeah. crazy that a quarter of DEF CON knew, knew who I was. And uh, yeah, it's just wild. And I don't know what to do with that yet, but that's crazy. <laughs> and it, for me, like Darknet Diaries kind of snuck up, right? Because I'm old and jaded. I don't, I don't do, I don't get out of my, my echo chamber as much as I should. But it was really cool because a whole bunch of former students of mine were like coming by with your stickers and they would find me and they'd be like, dude, have you, have you listened to this yet? I'm like, no, I haven't. I've heard lots of good things. And then like one of their prized possessions was they show me their phone and some of them had a picture taken with you. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, once again, kind of the reason why I ask is in some of those pictures, you actually look kind of uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> okay, so I weird. don't like my picture taken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it doesn't get easier. It's weird, but but you know, it, it's just amazing, like to me, how there are so many young people that are in college or just getting started in their career, and it's weird how many times they'll say, "I, I want to get into pen testing because of Jack and because of Darknet Diaries. I want to do physical assessments because of Darknet Diaries." You're hearing and, that in your classes? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Wow. They bring it up in the classes, like on our Discord channel. It's funny because whenever we're we're teaching. A lot of times I'll, I'll talk about a technique or something and they'll say, hey, that was this particular episode in Darknet Diaries. And then the students will actually post that in Discord and people will take that and consume it later, you know, and that's 
And that's really, really cool because I think what it does is it's like, for me, Darknet Diaries is getting away from this super Hollywood, horrible idea of what pen testing and hacking actually like what it looks like to where it really is. And I think it's giving them a better idea. And I think that one of the things that's most interesting to people is the stuff that you cover in Darknet Diaries is more interesting, more engaging, and it's better than what Hollywood is trying to portray. And, and I think that that's a great service to the industry to get people jazzed and excited and give them a goal of where they want to go in their career. Wow, that's, that's incredible. And I, I hear that on my side, too. People are like, I, I, I've been a mechanic or a painter or something, and I just I, I listen to your show, and I'm done. I'm, I'm now working yeah. on my Security Plus or something, and you've changed my everything. Like, I, I'm so passionate about this now. And so I'm glad yeah. that people find their passion. And yeah, I try to I try to make it as real as possible. Like I really want I don't want to make it Hollywood. I'm like I'm opposite of embellished. Like I'll I'll I'll, I'll underline stuff or I'll signpost right mm-hmm. just to like make sure you see this part. But I don't want to I don't want to f- make it too fancy or too dramatic. And so um, yeah, I try to I try to keep it real. One of the reasons that we wanted to bring you on today too is that we are announcing three open source versions of backdoors and breaches. So the Pandora's box is open. If you want to make an open source version of backdoors and breaches, feel free. And you were like, wait, really? Uh, yeah. So we have three versions today that we're going to announce that have been community built. And, and then like this wasn't planned for Jack to be here the same day that this was happening. We were just like, the, just the timing worked out. But what I've recommended to people over the years or last year or so, if they want to be an incident master in dark in backdoors and breaches is listen to Darknet Diaries. Oh, like, listen to stories, the stories, the elements, the incidents. Here's what happened. Here's how hackers do what hackers do. And it can just spur so many ideas for being an incident master in Darknet Diaries. So I'm going to show my screen here and you guys uh, all can keep talking to Jack. But I'm going to show people what we've been working what the community has been working on. If you go to Darknet Diaries, sorry to interrupt you, Deb. No, no, go ahead. If you, um, if you go to darknetdiaries.com slash categories, you can see different categories of what the episodes are. And there's a whole bunch of ones that I think are, are there's a pen test category. And in that, you can see how people, um, you know, what they, what they do to get in. That's where one of John Strand's episodes is. And the, um, the thing I was trying to say is, uh, you know, one of the things I like asking in those situations is what equipment are you bringing to this pen test, right? And so that's something that I think would work with uh, backdoors and breaches is figuring <laughs> wow. out what, what are the tools I need and what are the objects I need to break into this building or might need to break into this building. And you never know until you get there, but it's fun, yeah. to, fun to know what's out there. I, I thought it was funny when you asked me that. It was like, what did your mom take? And I'm like, a clipboard. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Yeah. A clipboard, a pen. And I think I mentioned a couple like thermometers and things, and that was that was pretty much all that was needed. Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> That's always like rule number one: you want to bring the least amount of things possible, right? Like, well, yeah. and, and like we've said in the past, you don't want to show up with like a backpack with a bunch yeah. of wires coming out of the back, right? That, that's totally not. I brought all my gear with me. It's right here. I'm I'm ready for everything. Got my ladder. Oh, cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying to break into a DoD facility, and I got a shirt that says, "I read your mom's email." It's like, yeah, you're probably not getting very far. <laughs> and also, how you dress too. Like, are you going to yeah, look absolutely. like a construction worker or uh, yeah. a hoodie yeah. or what? One of the other things I really like is, you know, I talk about the editing, right? Because. <laughs> It, it, this sounds strange, but whenever I was like w- talking with you, right, it wasn't that bad for me to get through some of the stuff. But whenever I listened to the story and like, just as something as simple as like where you put pauses in, like something happens and it's like there's a pause to let that settle in. Like, dude, I broke down and started crying. You know? Yeah. You, you so that um right that. there that you just said, I, I'll cut that out. Not because their ums are, you know, silly, but. There, there's other things like if you say because like if you say i well i had to get in there because i wanted to turn off the lights or something right i might yeah, take out yeah. that because and just say i wanted to get in there to turn off the lights and that's just yeah. sounds like a little bit more dramatic for some reason so i'll cut out like just filler words sometimes and that and or or my question like sometimes i'll ask yeah. you but why but to turn off the lights or something right and so i'll just ask to take my why out and yeah. and that becomes more dramatic. And that was a surprise to me to figure out that the more I just, if I just cut out words, it becomes more dramatic. And yeah, it does sometimes. It's weird. Well, it's really weird. 
and it doesn't become choppy, right? It, it, it kind of sets up those dramatic pauses. And I think sometimes whenever you're listening to things, they're going so fast that you can't absorb anything. And something's just like a, a two second, like quiet part really makes a certain section sink in. And it, and it kind of did that for me in, in, in a lot of really cool ways. So. Yeah. Sorry if I made you cry multiple times. No, again. dude, <laughs> dude, no, it, it was fine. It was, it was fine. I feel bad exploiting people. And you know, you might, you might ask that, like, how do you get people to tell these like horrible stories that happened to them? And it is, it was really, it was really awkward for me to ask questions that are like, you know tell me about this horrible time of your life but um after a while like i realized right away actually was that it's very cathartic for the person to just tell it and get it out in the open about the time they were arrested or did this horrible thing or you know all that stuff yours is very different than that but it's still it, it, people people feel good at the end and they feel good that their story is represented in a in a the best way possible so that other cool. people can understand because they they say mom, dad, you got to listen to this and all these things. And, and they're, they're getting their family to understand. And now their family understands their story better than they could ever tell their story. Well, and it was really cool. You know, I, I don't want to get into too many details, but it actually opened up a lot of conversations with the rest of my family, right? Because I had aunts and uncles they are like, there's no way my sister would ever do that. Like, <laughs> what the hell? You must have forced your mother to do that. And it kind of opened up these, these conversations in our family. And in a lot of ways, I, I think it, it actually got people to understand my mother in a way that n like a lot of people never got a chance to actually see her. And uh, it, it, it's kind of weird now because like, you know, just because of this and uh, at RSA and some things, people are like, holy crap, Rita's kind of famous now. Um, <laughs> and it, it, but it's, it's weird. Like I said, it opened up a lot of very, very interesting conversations in the family. Because there's still a lot of people that don't know what we do for a living and how this actually works. And they were like, so you had your mom break the law and you almost got your mom arrested. And it was like, no, 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 that's not how this went at all. So it, it definitely opened up some very interesting after conversations that I would have never expected or ever had without the show. Crazy. Wow. So wild. Yeah, I was actually shocked because you had like ranchers in South Dakota. You know, they called me up and like, so I was, uh, I was driving down the truck and I actually got this podcast on my phone because someone said that Rita was on it. And I was a little bit shocked by this dark net diaries. And now they listen to the show all the damn time. And you know, the guy that just drives tractors and takes care of cows is like listening to dark net diaries habitually now. It just blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's a weird, it's a weird line to walk. Like I, I thought for sure I'd have to pick a side, either the tractor guy or us to like no. to tell the show to and i thought for sure i wouldn't be able to to target both people but you'd be surprised this is the thing that surprises me over and over again is how much the tractor guy knows about it <laughs> like you think they don't know that much but man they know a lot they know a but, lot but also one of the things I, I i like about it is the show doesn't dumb things down right it's not but it's also not trying to be over someone's head technically it, it Somehow, just by setting it out there and for what it is and telling it in a real narrative and a real story actually ties it better than like saying, well, we're going to talk about this specific technique for breaking into a building or whatever. It, 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 it kind of makes that whole thing a lot more sticky for people that aren't even that technical at all. Yeah, yeah. Like there was a there was an episode with Tinker Sack, and uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to get de de just really uh, technical in it. You know, what tools did you use to break in? Tell me about like, you know, how does uh, you know, SMB something got happen. You know, how do all these things work? And so we got into it. And I and I said at the beginning, like, this is a really technical one. You, you, if if it's just over your head, sorry, but I, I just really wanted to do it this way. And so you know, even like my aunt was was texting me like, that was your best episode. I'm like, you don't know anything about hacking. How was that? How do you understand that episode? Like that wasn't for you. You don't. That wasn't. How did you get that? Yeah. So it's just it's always surprising to me to see how much people understand. Yeah. And maybe the technical details, they honestly don't need to know. I mean, as long as they know that it's like a means to a specific end, right? Like we don't have to get into the very technical details, but as long as they, they, they somehow know you're at point A and the narrative is going to go to point B and this thing assisted with that, they don't have to know the actual command line invocations. They don't have to know the protocols. They just know that it got them to the next part of that narrative. So maybe that has something to do with it. Because honestly, like I said, I, I, it's amazing to me like how many people aren't technical because i hear the same thing 
And they absolutely just love the show. And they actually learn a lot about computer security from it. Yeah. Well, I think there, I think there's also something between, you know, hacker broke into whatever and well, actually they just, you know, looked on Wikipedia and found somebody's details <laughs> and a password reset. Like yeah. it, they're, they're understanding what the hacker did to do the thing, I think is really profound for people who don't understand what we do. And so whether it was just as simple as that, or man, I had to use 16 different tools and let me tell you how hard it was to do each one of these tools. I think really does explain to, to non-infosec people what you know what it is we do, and I, I think it gives them a, a much much better understanding of yeah we have a lot of tools in our tool belt, and if the first one works, then our job looks really easy. But if it doesn't work, we do have like twenty other tools in our tool belt, and knowing when to yeah. use that and all that stuff is is really interesting to get into our minds and to hear that. So I think for the non non techies, it's just really fascinating to hear our thought process through that stuff. So, I like how somebody in Discord said that I'm single handedly responsible for the down downfall of farming in South Dakota. Thanks. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I appreciate right. that. Look, those those guys in tractors listen to can sometimes consume like ten hours of podcasts a day because they're in the tractors. Yeah. And they're not technical idiots. It's one of the things I think is interesting is there's always these assumptions that, you know, certain classes of people are not that technically proficient, but they pick up stuff real fast, you know. But they're all humans, right? Like you bring the human yeah. factor to it and, and it helps them. I mean, because you're such a good storyteller, obviously they want to tune in, but they're like, oh, this guy's just a normal person just like me. So, yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you. You know, talking about, you know, kind of springboarding off of what Deb said, you know, like normal people, uh, some of the people that you get on the show, like we wouldn't put in the category of just normal, like law buying type citizens, right? Are there any, has there been anything, or has there been any episodes that you've released? You're like, wow, that was super sketchy. Like talking with that person or wow, that technique is incredibly dangerous. And I, I don't know how I feel about sharing that with the world uh, or that attack. I feel like they might get some level of attribution from that. Has there ever been anything like where you're just kind of feel a little bit uncomfortable with kind of where that particular show or that interview went? Not necessarily because the person's a creep or anything, just because of the content and the things that you were hearing kind of, kind of scared you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, let's give an example, right? So like swatting, for example, right? You call the police on someone and they go and they raid somebody's house. And then you got, you know, it's a, it's a funny joke that some kids do. But it's, it's a much more serious thing than that, right? So there's been an incident where the police have raided in a house and actually killed the person inside when it was just a prank. It was just a prank. And so that's, you know, maybe, the, maybe one of the most dangerous, you know, horrible techniques you can do to to, to someone. And so, you know, we can talk about that in the lens of that. This is really bad. And I can actually slap them on the wrist or something and say, what you did is horrible. Don't you have like total remorse for that or something? And I, I, have, I haven't did that episode yet or anything, but yeah. you know, that's just kind of a situation where I can kind of jump in and be that moral compass for a minute and say, you know what, this, this is so bad. And let me tell you why it's so bad. And, and we can, we can t talk about why it's so bad and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So do you get people that reach out to you now? Like how many people are reaching out saying, I want to be interviewed by you? Or are you still searching? Like what's the, the process now that you're finding people to, to talk to? At first it was just kind of scooping up all the good stuff. I heard at Black Hat and DEF CON and stuff like that and saying, you know, you already go, gave the talk. Can you do the same thing on, on my show? And so it started there and then finding episodes. I would, I would put a Google alert in for like hacker indicted or hacker um, sentenced. <laughs> and so that, that tells me, okay, now we've got a full story here. If a hacker gets sentenced, now we know who, who they are, how they, what they did, how they got caught, and now they're sentenced like, okay, this story's ready. So that's a yeah. great Google alert that, you know, once a week I'll get something. And, and we don't hear that in our news cycles, right? We don't hear the end of the story of like, okay, well, it's finally sentenced and here's what happened. Yeah, we just kind of hear the cutting edge stuff. So it, it kind of it's kind of becomes like when I tell a story, like I did the LinkedIn breach um, just this last week. This week that happened in 2012, but just uh, six four months ago is when the hacker was finally sentenced for that. Right. So yeah. we can now go back and say, okay, let's hear that whole thing. And so that that's really fun for me to see that. But then I do get people like Jason was asking uh, people reaching out after they got out of prison and or whatever. Sometimes it's not prison, but saying, yeah, I've got a really crazy story for you. 
And those are those are very exciting. But the thing I've got to be careful about is, um, you know, somebody I don't know reaching out has got a story. I, I got to verify it. And so yeah. I've got to look at, you know, court records or, you know, some sort of verifiable proof. It doesn't have to be post posted, but I need to know. And so that's kind of the tricky part there. But yeah, I, I get some really, really interesting ones reach out to me now. But you also have those people. It, it, it's strange to me that there's there's the people that do get arrested or do get in trouble whenever they tell their side of the story, I would expect them to do more of kind of a revisionist history. But it seems like a lot of those people are like, this was stupid. This is where I screwed up. This was where my mistake was. It seems like they're far better to cut. It's almost like a confessional at that point. They're not trying to justify or say this is wrong. It's like, no, 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 no. really, I did that. That was bad. That was dumb. Don't be me. And instead to be much more open than you would expect them to be You're like, wow, I don't know if I would have just said that live on a podcast. Yeah, it's really fun to hear. Like, and I get the shivers when I hear people like really open up. Uh, you know, those those recent one, the guy was a uh, was scamming a ton of people, and you know, he was having huge parties and doing a ton of crazy stuff with his money, like just totally, you know, living it up. And I was like, "Were you happy?" And he's like, "No, I was totally <laughs> not happy. Like, it, it was happy for that moment that I was at the party, but when the party was over, and the next day, and then I was back to my scamming life." It was not, it was not, I was not a happy person at that time. And it's so weird to see that, right? Because some people think, oh yeah, I can, I can go, you know, be a baller just like that guy and, and make it all. And that guy's not happy. And he went to nine years in prison after that. So <laughs> but he was really not, not happy. happy. Yeah. <laughs> just once I want to hear one of those guys say, yeah, it was awesome. Like it was great. <laughs> yeah. Like it was the best thing ever. Yeah. It was so cool. I can't recommend crime highly enough. Like it was a great <laughs> career for anybody. I miss flying on airplanes because flying on airplanes was almost all pure just catching up on Dark Knight Diaries episodes. So now I have to carve out time during my day to, to find that opportunity. Uh, so John, please give me an opportunity to get on an airplane when the vaccine stops. As soon as we can, as soon as we yeah. can. And by the way, I'm excited to disappoint all of you because we have Jack from Dark Knight Diaries and then we go to an EDR. Uh, webcast, which is just like, seems like, oh, crap. Oh, human okay. feeling. Now well, we're here. We go. Play. It's it's the infosec equivalent of broccoli. <laughs> uh, Jack, any I've final words before uh, before we dismiss you? Because we got to make sure we dismiss you, so that way you don't accidentally bring down the whole webcast. Uh, for yeah. all of you that have been joining us, if you get a chance to go back, I'm sure Ryan's going to cut this into its own video and we'll put it on our Black Hills YouTube channel. So if you missed it, uh, you'll be able to get it. And then we also announced today three open source solutions for backdoors and breaches. And so if you want to create your own open source solution for backdoors and breaches, that is a thing you can do now. Uh, but Jack, any final words for us today? No, it's great being here with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And we'd love to get you back at some point in the future because it's just you know what you're doing for the community is just so awesome and once again on behalf of everybody thank you for the amount of time and effort that you put into it all right i'm glad you like it all right jack we will talk to you later thank you so much uh, debbie yeah. if you could miss him you got it thanks jack dismiss him <laughs> yeah. dismiss him yeah.